Hi everybody, this is Professor Paul Hicks uh, talking to you about philosophy again. Uh, today we're going to talk about language and what is the meaning of meaning itself. This is a rather odd question, I'm sure, but it's really important to try to understand the, uh, the nature of meaning itself in order to have the type of arguments and discuss what we need to discuss. So for example, um, in order to, say, talk about God, as we certainly will in later uh, in the semester, we have to define what a God actually would be and what type of God are we suggesting exists or what type of God are we suggesting doesn't exist. Um, if you're going to talk about, say, gender, what is gender? What does it mean to actually be a woman versus what does it really actually mean to be a man? Are there third genders or fourth genders or are we stuck in this kind of binary? Right, that's a question of meaning. That is, a, in fact, a question about language. So let's go ahead and take this sentence. Lucas is a dog. All right, that's my dog, Lucas. Lucas is a dog. You may have never actually heard that sentence before, but I'm willing to bet you have some sort of understanding of its meaning. So let me ask you this. What does it mean to say the statement, Lucas is a dog? Well, in order to understand that, we're going to have to first try to define what it means to be a dog. And so let's try to work this out, if we can, of what it actually means to be a dog. So what does it mean to be a dog? All right, think about this for a bit. Now, it's often when I ask this question to students, they'll come back to me and they'll say something along the lines of a dog is a four-legged animal that barks. But that can't possibly be the definition of dog. Because if I was to chop all of Lucas's legs off, and then he would no longer be an animal, a four-legged animal that barks, right? So that's not actually going to work, right? So we're going to need some sort of other definition of that. Also, if we're to say barks, we're not going to say that uh, dogs are the only animals that bark, do we? Uh, seals bark, for example. So that's that, that's not really going to work for us either. Um, you know, students will come up with all sorts of, you know, uh, examples of how to try to define this term. Um, it's actually going to be it's kind of a trick question. I don't think you really can answer this question very easily. Let's see if you can answer what it means to be a dog after we get through this actual lecture. Um, so let's take the argument here uh, that follows. One, taking the life of an innocent person is murder. Two, Abortion takes the life of an innocent person. Three, therefore abortion is murder. Now this is in fact a deductively valid argument. The question is going to come down to whether or not it's sound. That is, the premises really do support the conclusion, but are the premises really true? If the premises are actually true, then you are in fact committed to the truth of that conclusion. But I'm willing to bet that at least half of you are watching this video right now actually want to reject that conclusion. Why is it that you want to reject the conclusion? How is it possible for you to actually reject the conclusion? Well, part of it is going to have to do with how do you define person, right? In order for this to be a sound argument, it's not enough for it to be deductive and valid, but the premises have to be true. So if you take a look at, say, premise number two, abortion takes the life of an innocent person. Now, is that true? Well, this is going to be dependent upon how you define person. Is a zygote a person? Is a fetus a person? When does something gain personhood? And what does it mean to be a person? This is going to be the difference between those of you who believe the conclusion to be a true statement and those of you that believe the conclusion to be a false statement, right? So how does it that we define person? Now, this is not a very easy thing to define. Right? We couldn't define dog just a minute ago. So how are we actually going to define even a more abstract idea like person? Well, in order to do something like that, we're going to have to try to understand the meaning of meaning and how it is that we actually come to understand the definitions of terms and the meanings of actual terms. So let me talk a little bit about some of the problems that we have when it comes to uh, understanding meaning and language itself. So I could say the same thing and I can use different words in saying it. So for example, if I was to say, Sophie is the oldest person in the room. Everybody in the room is younger than Sophie. 
of all the people born in the room, Sophie was born first. Right? So here I am saying pretty much the same thing. The meaning seems to be the same, but I'm using different words to actually get that meaning. How can I do that? How is it that you understand what I actually am saying? Right? Also, it seems that there are some statements that we can have about literal meaning. And that's not necessarily the meaning that we actually need. So, for example, the philosopher uh, Paul Grice, he uh, had this theory of meaning that we're going to talk about in just a bit. But here's an example of a problem that he has. Imagine a student comes to me and says, uh, Professor Hicks, can you write a letter of recommendation for me to get a scholarship? Uh, will you only write good things about me? And I say, yes, I could do that for you. Now, let's say that I, in that letter of recommendation, I write something along the lines, uh, Sophie shows up on time and is a very snappy dresser. Okay. I now send that letter of recommendation to the scholarship committee. Is she going to get the scholarship? What is it that I actually literally said? And what was the intention behind what I actually said? So what I literally said is that she you know, dresses well and she shows up on time. Those are good qualities to have. But what the scholarship committee is going to hear is the best thing that I could say about her is that she dresses nice and shows up on time. I didn't say anything academic about her. And so I have a certain intention about whether she's going to get that scholarship or whether I'm recommending her for the scholarship or not. And the audience, that is the actual scholarship committee, received that, even though I didn't say anything about it at all. How is that possible? This is really interesting. Um, another problem that we have when we come to understand language is metaphors. So for example, what if I was to say something along the lines of my kids are the light of my life. What does that mean to say they're the light of your life? How could that possibly be? Right? What, what does it mean to be the light of your life? I mean, you're talking about like an actual literal light bulb? There must be something else that you mean by that. Or if I was to say love is a battlefield. That's not literally true, is it? What does that mean? How could love possibly be a battlefield? That doesn't make any actual sense. Or my life has been a rocky road since my divorce. Well, what does that mean? Right? Well, it means that you know I've had a you know difficult time since I've got divorced. But I literally said my life has been a rocky road. How could something such as my life ever be a rocky road? Do you understand? I mean, that literally cannot be that. Or what if I was to say, I knew she was the woman for me because when I met her, she swept me off my feet and stole my heart. If you're not a native speaker of the language, when you hear that a woman stole a man's heart, what are you thinking? It would seem rather horrific, don't you think? It would be actually rather inexplicable as well, but it would seem like a very horrifying event. But how did you actually know that it wasn't literally, why that it wasn't to be taken literally, that it's really just a metaphor? Right? This is a problem when trying to understand language itself. Okay, so uh, philosophers have come up with all sorts of different meanings or different theories for meaning itself. And so we're going to go through a couple of these theories. There are philosophers which hold all of these theories today. I will try to explain the theory to you and give you some of the objections to the theory. But please keep in mind that there are philosophers that hold these theories and they have responses to these objections that I'm going to give you. But since this is not a philosophy of language class and just a very brief overview of a couple of the theories, I'm not going to be able to get into the real fine details of it. Okay? So let's go ahead and talk about the first one, Plato. All right? Let's start talking about ancient Greece. Plato was a probably one of the best known philosophers, probably the best studied philosopher in all of philosophy. He was a student of the philosopher Socrates, who we're going to talk a little bit about uh, later on. Um, and we can't really um, underestimate how important Plato is to philosophy. He really kind of gets philosophy going in the way that we kind of understand philosophy today. 
So let's go ahead and think about uh, for just a bit um, what Plato would mean by meaning. What is it that Plato understands meaning to be? So Plato believed that ideas existed. All right, so let me ask you that. Do ideas exist? And if they do, where are they? For example, I have the idea of 2 plus 3 equals 5. That is an idea. That's an expression, which is an idea. And I, I want to say that that's a true idea. But what makes that true? Is it just because it's in my head that that makes it true? I don't think so, because if I think that if uh, I cease to exist, then the thought expression 2 plus 3 equals 5 is not in my head anymore. Imagine if all minds cease to exist. Would 2 plus 3 still equal 5? Yeah, because it's an idea. Okay, so where do these ideas exist? Plato argued that there was another realm, and that in this realm, it's outside of space and outside of time. And this is the true nature of reality in this realm. And this is where all ideas actually exist. Now we talk about the word idea, but there's not a real trans exact translation of what we mean here. Uh, he also uses the term uh, form. Uh, so we, it's either form or idea, and I'm going to use these interchangeably because uh, there's not an exact translation from the ancient Greek to English today. Okay, so. He believed that there is this realm of the forms, a realm of ideas, where all ideas exist. And it was the goal of the philosopher to understand this realm of the forms or this realm of ideas, because we are seeking truth and wisdom, and we're seeking understanding of the ideas. And so the philosopher is always attempting to get into this realm of ideas. All right. Um, so what does it mean to be a dog under this uh, kind of understanding? What is an actual dog? Well, when you think of a dog, notice that not all dogs are alike. Some say it can be a German Shepherd dog. Uh, some dogs are, say, like really small, like Chihuahuas. Uh, some dogs have a very flat face, say, like an English Bulldog or a Pug. Uh, some dogs have very long snouts, very long noses. Right? So how in the world do we describe and understand the definition of a dog when dogs come in different shapes, different colors, different sizes, and they're not all exactly alike? Well, Plato says that you essentially have an idea of the form of dog. That is this understanding of dogness. You have an idea of dogness itself, and then it's from having that idea of dogness that you are able to actually point out the instantiated dogs in the world. All right, so you have an idea of dogness. Not all dogs look alike, but they do kind of take a, a sort of form, don't they? And you're, you are familiar with that form. And so if you're familiar with that form, then you are in fact familiar with dogness. Um, so what does it mean when we say Lucas is a dog? What we're saying is Lucas participates in the form of dogness that the w meaning of dog is just the form of dogness itself. All right, so why would we want to hold this kind of theory? It seems kind of weird to say that there's this non-space-time realm where ideas and stuff exist. One, because I want to say, how is it possible for me, somebody clearly in the space-time realm, to ever grasp this non-space-time realm? Well, Plato actually believed that before we were born, we lived in the realm of the ideas. We existed in the realm of the ideas, and we are familiar with all ideas. And then we were born, and we forgot all of them. And then Plato argues that we have to somehow recollect what we have forgotten. And so when we are learning, we're really just recollecting. Um, that seems, you know, you really have to buy into a lot of his philosophy in order to kind of accept something like that. So why do we want to believe in a realm of the forms? So um, Plato does give us some reasons to actually accept it. So I'm going to go ahead and start off with a couple arguments for it. Number one, this is one I'm going to call the argument from imperfection. So think about um, a shape, say a circle. What is a circle? Right, what is circularity? What does it actually mean for something to be a circle? 
Well, we could define it as, say, um, something along the lines of every point on the line is equal distance from the center, right? And that would be a circle. We could define it that way. But let me ask you something. Where did you understand circles to exist? So I could draw all sorts of circles, and they're never going to be a perfect circle. I want to know, what about perfect circularity? Now notice, that cannot possibly exist in the physical space-time realm. But there are still truths about circles. There are still truths about what circularity actually is. And if perfect circularity cannot exist in the space-time realm, then where is it? There must exist a realm which is outside the laws of physics for which perfect circularity can exist. All right. Um, another argument is an argument from knowledge. And the argument from knowledge essentially states that knowledge is infallible, knowledge does not change, and this is what Plato believed. Uh, but, and so if we have, say, mathematical knowledge, there has to be some sort of unchanging realm where mathematical knowledge can exist. So 7 plus 5 equals 12, there's a linguistic expression. Is that true, or is that just my belief that 7 plus 5 equals 12? Right? Where is the truth of it? What makes a, an expression of that sort true? Well, according to Plato, does it conform to the ideas, the realm of the forms? Um, the last argument I want to talk about in favor of this is probably one of the better arguments, though um, there's ways out of it. Uh, it's called the one over the many argument. Now, think of um, roundness, for example. Let's say I brought five round objects here. I had said an apple, an orange, a baseball, you know, a, a tennis ball, whatever, golf ball. So they got. I have five round objects here, and I ask you, does roundness actually exist? Well, clearly, if you're looking at these round objects, roundness must exist, right? Well, if roundness actually exists, how can it exist in more than one object at the same time? Notice the laws of physics, get rid of quantum physics here for just a bit, because I don't think really most of us understand that. But um, according to the laws of physics, something cannot be in more than one place at the same time, yet roundness seems to be in more than one place at the same time. And so what Plato argued is that it must be outside the laws of physics, and the realm of the form, the realm of the idea, is outside the laws of physics, and therefore can actually answer the question for us. So there is, in fact, a possibility for us to say, if we accept the law, uh, the theory of the forms, or Plato's theory of ideas, then we can make sense of roundness, because it's not um, stopped by the laws of physics. It's not constrained by the laws of physics. Okay, so why should we maybe reject Plato's theory? What are some problems for Plato's theory? Well, one, there's what we call the infinite regress argument. Philosophers, for the most part, hate this idea of an infinite regress, and uh, it's, it's not something we can really conceptualize, we can't really understand. Uh, so we like to think that things, say, have a beginning. You'll begin to see this type of argument when we talk about the cosmological argument for the existence of God. Um, but here is the infinite regress, which is caused by Plato's theory. So let's take, say, the form of circularity again, or the form of roundness. So the form of roundness, is it round? If it's not round, then what makes it the form of roundness, or the idea of roundness? See. We're supposed to say that this thing is outside space and time and that roundness has no shape. But clearly roundness has some sort of shape. So the form of roundness must be round. But now here's a problem. If the form of roundness is round, then what makes it the actual form of roundness? What we would actually need is to say, well, if the form of roundness is round, then it's one more object, one more round object within the set of all round objects that need a form of roundness to how to explain how all of those objects can be round. 
All right, so now, in order to understand that the form of roundness is round, then we need a form of roundness to explain how that form of roundness is round. Well, that really pushes the question back one, because is that form of roundness round? If it's not round, what makes it the form of roundness? I mean, roundness needs to take shape. If it is round, then it's just one more object within the set of all round objects that needs a form to explain how all of those objects can be round. And we can just keep going on like this ad infinitum, right? You need a form of roundness to explain the form of roundness to explain the form of roundness of how the form of roundness is round. We keep going, and we can just keep pushing it back. So philosophers tend not to like that kind of infinite regress. I'm not sure um, that's a very good argument, but it's an argument that I've seen made. Now, the other one that I want to talk about is whether or not this is a necessary um, argument. Do we have to, are we really committed to having to take Plato's theory uh, seriously here, or is it in fact unnecessary? So there is um, uh, a man by the name of William of Occam who develops what we call Occam's Razor. And essentially what Occam's Razor is about is, is you have two theories, and they both can explain the phenomena that you are trying to explain, right? You're, they can both do it, but they can't both be right. Which one is right? And so what Occam did is he said, you choose the theory that does not multiply entities beyond necessity. So the theory that commits you to believing in extra stuff in order to explain whatever you need to explain versus a theory that doesn't commit you to believe in an extra stuff, but it still explains what you need to explain, you should go with the second theory. Right? Do not commit yourself to a theory that forces you to create entities just to make sense of the theory. This is what uh, we're talking about. So can we explain language without having to appeal to this extra stuff, specifically uh, the realm of the forms, the realm of the ideas? So um, let's go ahead and move away from Plato for just a bit. And now I want to talk about a particular theory to where we're going to, instead of reaching towards the heavens or towards the realm of the ideas as Plato is attempting to do, maybe we can just make sense of language just by looking at the stuff around us. So Plato had a pretty famous student by the name of Aristotle. And Aristotle, I'm not going to say fully really creates this uh, particular theory that we're going to talk about. But he really gets this idea going that, you know, we should stay more empirical. We should really look more to the physical world itself rather than to some bizarre realm of the forms or something like that that Plato was interested in. Uh, and so now we're going to start trying to understand language in such a way where we're only appealing to physical facts and to the empirical world itself. And this is going to be a theory that's called the reference theory of meaning. So the reference theory of meaning essentially states that a word, term, or phrase means whatever physical object is pointed out by that word, term, or phrase. So, for example, if you take um, dogs, what is the meaning of dogs? Well, the meaning of dogs, if I was to get a really big warehouse and take all of the dogs in the world and put them in there, such that the only things in this warehouse were dogs, but all dogs were in there. And you asked me, what does it mean to be a dog? All I would have to do is open up the warehouse and say, those things, those things are dogs. That is dogness. It is the physical stuff itself. Now, why do we like a theory like this? Um, it, there does seem to be some sense to it that this is how we learn language. So, for example, I have two kids, and if my... A uh, daughter who's learning language right now, uh, she came to me and said, Daddy, what is a dog? Well, what am I going to do? I'm going to point to a physical dog. Or I'm going to point to Lucas. I'm going to say, Lucas is a dog. Now, in her mind, she's going to get, okay, four legs, furry, must be a dog. And then she comes, say, maybe we go to the park, and she comes across a squirrel and says, Daddy, dog. I go, no, sweetheart, that's a squirrel. And so by a process of elimination, she understands some things are dogs and some things are not dogs. And she creates the idea of dogness through the experience of actual dogs. 
So the word dog really just means the physical stuff, the physical objects that are pointed to when we say dog. All right. Um, so there seems to be uh, some good reasons to accept the theory like this. And I'm going to try to give you some reasons or some objections that are very common to this particular reference theory of meaning. Um, and we'll see if it actually can hold up. And once again, remember, there are still people that believe in reference theory of meaning, very smart people. They have responses to these objections. Okay? So the first objection I want to talk about is I know what some words, phrases, or terms mean, but I don't know what they refer to. So, for example, if I was to say the fattest cat in the world, do you understand what that would mean? Do you know who the fattest cat in the world is? I'm, you know, I'm wanting to bet you don't. And yet, do you know the meaning of the statement or phrase, the fattest cat in the world? If you do, and reference and meaning really are the same thing, then you appear to know the meaning of something but not know the reference. How could that be? Right? Reference theory of meaning says they're the same, but it doesn't actually seem that they are. Um, another objection that we have to the reference theory of meaning some words, phrases, or terms have meaning, but they lack some sort of reference. So some terms and phrases have meaning, but they lack a reference. This is what we call the empty set. So examples of this are going to be Santa Claus, the Tooth Fairy, the Easter Bunny, uh, a Chupacabra, uh, Incubi, the Succubi, Magical Dragons and Fairies and Leprechauns. All of those terms seem to have some sort of meaning. But notice, none of those things exist. Well, if reference theory of meaning is true, and that in order to have meaning, one must have reference, then what happens to terms like the Easter Bunny or Santa Claus or the Tooth Fairy? When they don't have reference, that means they are meaningless. Now, you can accept that they're, in fact, meaningless, and many reference theorists do. But is that really true? If I was to ask all of you to uh, think in your head of Santa Claus, I'm willing to bet most of you are thinking fat guy, red suit, white beard. Right? All of us came to the same meaning of that. How is that possible if reference theory of meaning is true? So this seems to be a bit of a problem for the reference theorists. Um, but once again, they do have answers to some of this stuff. Um, how about some words and phrases or terms mean something different, but they actually uh, refer to the same set? So the example that I want to give to you is the morning star and the evening star. So what is the morning star and the evening star? The morning star is the last star you see in the morning as the sun comes up. The evening star happens to be the first star you see as the sun goes down in the evening. All right, so the morning star and the evening star. Here's the thing. The morning star and the evening star are actually the same object. The morning star and the evening star are, in fact, not even stars at all, but rather the planet Venus. So the morning star is the evening star. All right. Well, let's go ahead and say the morning star is the evening star. Um, when I said that to you, did I teach you something new? That the morning star is the evening star. I think I did. But now let's say the morning star, take the proposition or the statement, the morning star is the evening star. Well, let's go ahead and take out the first part, the morning star, and replace it with the evening star. Now, I can do this because the morning star and evening star refer to the same object, therefore it must have the same meaning. And now I come up with the proposition, the evening star is the evening star. Now we have two propositions. The morning star is the evening star, and the evening star is the evening star. Do they mean the same thing? I don't think so. Right? I don't think so. I think... I mean, if I say the morning star is the evening star, I'm teaching you something new, that these two ideas are actually the same idea. But if I say the evening star is the evening star, I'm not teaching you anything new. 
That's just the property of identity. That's just to say I am who I am. Right? So one sentence I teach you something new, another sentence I don't, and that seems to be because they mean something different. Well, if that's true, reference theory of meaning is out. All right. So um, let's go ahead and move on from reference theory of meaning. And I want to now talk about another idea theory of meaning uh, rather than where Plato's idea theory of meaning is these ideas exist outside of my mind. This idea theory of meaning, I'm going to say, are ideas that exist internal to my mind. We see some of the beginnings of this type of idea or this type of theory in the philosopher John Locke. Like Aristotle, he was an empiricist, and we'll talk about that later on in the semester. But um, Locke argued that I have certain mental content going on in my mind. And that mental content, I use language to express that mental content and then to have the mental content raised in your mind, right? So I have ideas in my mind. I want to get these ideas in your mind. What language really is, is just an expression of those ideas. That's it. So do ideas actually exist? Yes, but they exist within the mind, not like what Plato says, that they're not, they don't exist outside the mind itself. Um, so here's some real simple problems for a theory like this is going to be, are my ideas your ideas? How do we ever have successful communication if the mental content and the words I say refer to my mental content and the mental content when you say the word is yours? I can't read your mind, you can't read mine. So for example, think of what a word dog means. What's happening in your mind when you understand the meaning of the word dog? What's happening is you're probably picturing a dog. Now, I'm going to go ahead and picture my dog, Lucas, and you're going to picture your dog, Fluffy, right? And so we're picturing dogs, but our mental content is different. Do you not understand the meaning of the word dog? Or is the meaning of the word dog different for you than it is for me? It doesn't seem like that should be the case. Um, there's a more updated version of this particular type of theory. Uh, it often goes by the, ter the term mental or mentalist theory. Uh, there's Paul Grice, a philosopher we talked about just a second ago. Um, he's, uh, he's really kind of laid this type of theory out. So Grice developed an analysis of meaning which could really be understood as a conjunction of two claims. One, that facts about what expressions mean are to be explained or analyzed in terms of facts about what speakers mean by utterance of them, and two, facts about what speakers mean by their utterances can be explained in terms of their intention. What this theory does is that it reduces meaning to the content of the intention of the speaker. So to understand this theory, let's distinguish between the meaning or the content of linguistic expressions and what speakers mean by utterances employing those types of expressions. So for example, Suppose that in response to a question about the weather in the city where I live, I say, well, Santa Clarita is not exactly Hawaii. Well, what is the meaning of the utterance? Well, the meaning of that sort of utterance is fairly clear, that it expresses a tr very true proposition that Santa Clarita is not identical to Hawaii. They're not the same thing. But is that what I meant? Probably not. When I say Santa Clarita is not... Uh, Hawaii, what I'm saying, we're talking about the weather, what I'm saying is that the weather in Hawaii is probably better than the weather in Santa Clarita, or that specifically the Santa Clarita weather is not as good as Hawaii weather. So I actually intended something else. Well, what was the real meaning of my particular utterance? It seems that the intention had something to do with that. Right? The propositions that speakers mean to say by their utterances include propositions often other than the one that was actually expressed by the sentence or used in the context. So, for example, if you ask, what did you mean by that? You're not asking for the meaning of the utterance, but rather what is the intention behind the utterance, and that would in fact be the meaning. So Grice thought that speaker meaning could be analyzed in terms 
of the communicative intentions of speakers, and in particular, their intentions to cause beliefs in their audience. So for example, if I was to say, you're standing on my foot, I'm not trying to inform you of a simple fact. I'm actually, right, I'm not just uttering that proposition, you're standing on my foot. I'm actually trying to get you to do something. Get off my foot. I need you to get off my foot. That's what I actually am intending to say, and that's what the audience understood. Right, so now we have this intention and we have the audience. So a Gricean analysis of speaker meaning can really be formulated as follows. That A means P, P just stands in for proposition, by uttering X if and only if A intends that uttering X, that one, his audience come to believe that proposition, P, and two, the audience recognizes the intention and three, that one occur on the basis of two, right? So what, what does a proposition mean? That whatever the audience came to believe and whatever the audience recognized the intention of the speaker, right? So what we have here then is two things. We have the speaker and their intention and we have the audience uh, and their understanding of the speaker's intention. Okay, what's wrong with this? Well, one possible problem for this theory is um, what happens when we're using language but there's no intended audience. So, like my own thoughts. What's happening in your thoughts? Right, you're, you're thinking, but you're, you, and you're talking to yourself, aren't you? You're, you have these, you know, this, these sentences that you're actually saying to yourself. You're the speaker that has intention. Who's the audience? Are we to say that we split ourselves off into multiple selves? I don't think so. So what are we supposed to say? Who's the audience? This is a potential problem. But once again, um, people who believe these theories are actually going to have other actual uh, responses to this. All right, so what's going to be the meaning of dog under... Grice's type of theory. Well, it's going to be what was the intention of the speaker when dog was actually said, and what does the audience understand dog to actually mean? Okay. All right, so the last theory I want to talk about is what we call meaning as use, and we understand this theory through Ludwig Wittgenstein. Uh, Wittgenstein is a really important philosopher, especially with theory of language. And this particular theory has been, I think, rather influential. And it's going to be a theory that we kind of adopt in this class only because I don't have uh, an, enough time with you to be able to go through all the different theories, right? And how it is that they're actually uh, used. So let's go ahead and take um, certain sentences here. Let's say, my house is green. My household is green. My lawyer is green. Tiger Woods hit the ball onto the green. You notice what's happening here? The word green changes its meaning in every sentence, right? It changes every single sentence. Well, how do you know what meaning of green is supposed to be used? Well, you understand the context that it's actually set in, don't you? And, th and so you understand how it's actually being used because you're a native speaker of the language most likely, or at least you've practiced our language enough to understand it. Um, and the meaning of it is really derived on how that term happens to be used. All right? What is the purpose of that? What is the use of that particular word or term? So, for example, um, let's say uh, my wife and I are driving up to San Francisco, and we're driving up I-5, and I know about every hour or so there's going to be a Starbucks. And we're coming, we've been in the car for a couple hours, and I see that there's, in fact, a Starbucks coming up, and I say, hey, Starbucks, what does that mean? 
what was meant when I said, hey, Starbucks? I didn't mean to just point out that there is a Starbucks there, right? I'm asking questions such as, do you want to stop? Do you want coffee? Do you want something to drink? Do you want something to eat? Do you want to get out and stretch your legs? All of this is understood by my saying, hey, Starbucks, right? And so what has been happening here with all these other theories of language is that they assumed each word had some sort of meaning and that gave meaning to the sentence. Where Wittgenstein kind of flips that around and says that the sentence actually has meaning and that gives meaning to the individual words themselves, right? So context seems to mean everything. And what's really important here is to understand that the sentence has meaning. And this is going to be really interesting when we try to understand and how to define terms, say, like woman, or when we're understanding, say, certain feminist uh, linguistic theories such as, say, Robert Baker, right? Robert Baker is a philosopher that argued from a meaning as you standpoint that the way that we talk about women is very, very sexist, right? Because he says... You know, he gives a study where he says, look at that woman over there. And you take out the word woman, replace it with another word such that the meaning of the sentence keeps, right, that it keeps its meaning. Um, right? So what word would you use if you were to take out the word woman and replace it with a word? Well, some people might say lady, female, sister. Um, but men would often say words like chick, bitch, slut, whore, something like that. Can we understand what men are thinking when they say things like that? Isn't it just through meaning as used that we're able to understand this? Can we understand that men uh, do not value women when they talk like that? So, you know, just a little something to think about. If you want to look it up, look up Robert Baker. All right. So now I want to talk to you about just some examples and uh, that ways of philosophers have really used uh, these different theories. So uh, the first one I want to talk about is the brain and the bat argument. So imagine, if you could, that while you were sleeping last night, a mad scientist philosopher came into your room, took your brain out of your body, put it in a vat, hooked it up to a supercomputer, which is right now feeding you signals, making you believe that you're sitting here listening to a lecture on philosophy, where in reality, you're just a brain in a vat in the scientist's lab, hooked up to a supercomputer. All right, so do you understand? You're, you're a disembodied brain where the, sen the supercomputer is making you believe that you're sensing certain world around you. But you're not really sensing that world. It's just a computer making you believe it. All right. How do you know that you are not a brain in a vat? How do you know that you're not a brain in a vat? Can you know? Can language and these theories of language help us try to understand? Well, the philosopher Hilary Putnam, who was a reference theory of meaning person, he argued that I can come to understand that I'm not a brain in a vat because of how I uh, use language. So let's say, for example, that I actually am a brain in a vat. Now, when I ask the question, am I a brain in a vat, what do words like brain and vat mean? Are they coming from the experience of actual brains and vats? No. The supercomputer would be feeding me this information that, about brains and vats. And so the meaning of brain and vat, if it has to come from experience and it has to have an actual physical record, in order for this question to be meaningful, am I a brain in a vat, it must refer to actual brains and actual vats. If I really am a brain in a vat, then when I say words like brain and vat, I'm not referring to actual brains and actual vats because the supercomputer is creating those ideas for me. 
So if I am a brain in a vat, I am not able to ask the question, am I a brain in a vat? If I'm not a brain in a vat, and I'm actually, my brain's in my body, I'm able to actually ask the question with the same meaning of, am I a brain in a vat? So here we have reference theory solving a possible philosophical problem about whether or not we are brains and vats. All right. Let me go ahead and give you another um, question for you here. Imagine that there is an Earth and a universe just like this one, right? So in this new universe, there is actually an Earth just like ours. We'll call it Twin Earth or Twerth. Now, Twin Earth or Twerth and Earth are exactly the same. That is, there's actually a twin Paul Hicks giving a lecture on philosophy of language right now, as just as there's a, an actual Paul Hicks on Earth giving that language lecture right now. Um, everything's exactly the same except for one thing, just one thing and one thing only. On Earth, water is made from H2O. Water is H2O. Now, on Twerth, Water is not made of H2O, it's made of what we'll call XYZ. So water equals H2O, but twatter equals XYZ. Now, twatter is used in the exact same way that water is used. That is, it flows through the rivers, humans drink it to keep hydrated, and it's used in every single way, exactly the same. Here's the question for you. Are water and twatter the same thing? Are water and twatter the same thing? If you're going to be a reference theory of meaning person, then the meaning of the word water derives out of the physical stuff. Well, if the physical stuff of H2O is different than the physical stuff of XYZ, then reference theory is going to be committed to saying that water and twatter are two different things. If you're a meaning as used person and you're asking yourself, well, does, how is twatter used? Is it, is it used in the same way that water is? And if it is, then water and twatter could, in fact, be the same thing. So it really depends on what your meaning of language actually is and what your philosophy of language is. Okay, one last example before we go. Um, imagine that there was an island that for, was not seen another person for over 25,000 years. They have been isolated this entire time. But of course they create a language. Now you're an explorer and you come across this island and you're hiding in the bushes as two inhabitants of this island happen to walk by. Now on the trail as these two inhabitants walk by, a bunny rabbit scurries across the trail. And one inhabitant of the island points to the rabbit and says, Gavagai. What does Gavagai mean? Does it mean rabbit? I mean, that's a possibility, isn't it? Um, it could also mean dinner, or it could also mean uh, a new pet for the family. It can mean all sorts of things. Here's one thing that it could mean. It could mean undetached rabbit parts. Right? Undetached rabbit parts. What is the meaning of the phrase undetached rabbit parts? Rabbit parts that are all attached? Okay. Imagine now you're pointing to the rabbit and you say Gavagai. Is it possible that you really mean undetached rabbit parts? Probably not. Because why would you ever say such a thing? What use would you ever possibly have? for saying on detached rabbit parts. You probably wouldn't have any use for it. And so if you don't have use for it, you would never have come up with a definition because for you, meaning derives out of use. All right, well, so those are some of the theories of language um, that are rather popular in philosophy. Um, think them over, answer your questions. Uh, just send me an email if you don't understand something and I will try to get back to you as soon as possible. All right?
Have a good one. Bye-bye.